Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So that's the first 12 verses. Now you can relax. I can tell you honestly, you can relax. Because I will actually only be looking, you know, at the first three. Uh, not all 12. And then I'll also only be focusing on verse 3, which is the first of the Beatitudes. And then only on the first six words also. So, you know, there's definitely way too much here to be able to, to handle, um, you know, in, in, in one uh, session like, like we have together this morning. But in chapter 4, we read that, that Jesus was tempted by the devil. And he successfully defeated him and resisted him by using the word of God. And the devil left him, we are told. And when the devil left him, it said, uh, the, the verse tells us, angels came and ministered to Jesus, or as the, the NIV says, attended to him. Angels came and attended to him. And, and then after that, we see that Jesus starts preaching. And he goes out and he preaches after hearing that John the Baptist had been put in prison. And from that time on, it says in verse 17, he began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he calls his first disciples, uh, Peter and Andrew, and eventually James and John, the sons of Zebedee also referred to as the sons of thunder and then he heals many it says he heals many teaching in synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease um, relieving those uh, who were demon possessed epileptics paralytics he healed them and then large crowds from galilee and decapolis jerusalem judea and the reason across the Jordan began following him. And now we come to chapter 5. And this is interesting because it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside. That's why this is sometimes referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus went up on the mountainside. Now that's very interesting. I, I learned this as I was doing some research on this. And it says that Jesus went up on the mountainside. Now imagine this is the mountainside. And you are, you are part of the crowds over there. And it says Jesus sat down. He sat down. Because in those days, the teacher always sat down. And the audience stood. So how about we try that this morning? The audience stands while the teacher sits down and teaches. But obviously we're not going to do this because, I mean, that's exactly why we have a midweek service, is it? So that people who are not able to, to come at other times are able to come and, you know, we are not going to try and do what was done many years ago. Um, I wouldn't mind sitting down. In fact, as you can see, I'm not a person who moves around a lot. I stand in one place. <laughs> I, 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 try, I move it maybe as far as this, and then I come back to this over here. Do you remember the days, uh, who of you remember the days when James used to teach from up top of city on one of those bar stools? I wouldn't attempt that because I'd probably fall off it. And I wouldn't attempt to walk around as much as Bevan also because I may get tripped. I may trip over my own feet. 
So I prefer to stand and hold firmly to this lectern in front of me over here. But that is what they did. Jesus begins his Sermon on the Mount by stating eight, or possibly sometimes nine, declarations of blessedness. Blessedness, the state of blessedness. And what follows is what is known commonly as the Beatitudes. Now, another uh, word for beatitude is actually just a very old word for blessedness. Beatitude is a blessed saying. The blessings, we could refer to this as the blessings of Jesus. The Webster's Dictionary, however, describes it as a state of bliss. The state of being blessed and blessedness is referred to as an utmost state of bliss. But then some have also referred to it as the attitudes that should be characteristic of those who follow after God. Or in this case of following Jesus. The be attitudes. Attitudes that should be cultivated and developed um, in our lives as we follow on after God. Now, you know, these days, you know, in, in the days when, when, uh, when I went to, uh, um, to Bible college for my uh, Bible and theological training, they, Google didn't exist. So all of what research had to be done by going through the the books, you know, Young's commentary, Matthew Henry's commentary, all the different commentaries that were this thick and this big. And it was the great ambition of every young preacher to get all, a hold of all those books. Nowadays, we can't find people who want that books. You know, when Ken left here not so long ago, he was trying to give some of the books away that he'd accumulated over the years. No one wanted to take it. Because these days, we can just go on Google and we find it. So when I say I did some research, don't think that I poured you know, over thousands of books or even 10. I just went straight to Google and I found that the Greek word used for blessed is makarios, which also can be translated as Happy. Yeah. Happy. So what Jesus is saying here is that if you want to be happy, or if you want to be blessed, or experience a state of blessedness, then these are the attitudes or the characteristics that I should learn to develop and cultivate uh, in my life. The NIV, NIV uses the word blessed. King James, I think, also uses the word blessed. Other translation, translations use the word happy. So Jesus is, is in fact giving us eight conditions for happiness. So who doesn't want to be happy? I mean, really. Do we all want to be happy? Of course we do. I think so. But let me tell you, I'm not the world's most happiest guy. My wife will tell you that. But who wants to be blessed? Yes. I certainly want to be blessed. Now, you know, maybe, you, you, maybe you've heard this, maybe, maybe you haven't. There, there was a song written in 1963. And the song was released by a guy called Jimmy Soul. It, 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 it really isn't a... The, you know, the, the, most, the greatest song as far as words are concerned, but it says that Calypso, uh, uh, you know, rhythm, uh, Caribbean, and it was written for the movie My Friends, My Best Friend's Wedding. Anybody watch that film? Yeah, Carol's nodding her head over there. Somebody watched that. I, was, I, didn't, I don't remember seeing that, but the song is still played on the radio from time to time, so that's where I hear it. And, and these are the words. Listen to this. It says, if you want to be happy, 
for the rest of your life. Listen to this advice. Never make a pretty woman your wife. You hear that? Moeilijk uitzoek. If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, never make a pretty woman your wife. Do you want to hear the rest of the words? Maybe not. Yes. Okay. yes. It's not actually. So it says, so for my, from my personal point of view, now this is the word that don't actually sound so great for me. It says, get an ugly woman to marry you. If you want, because, because it says a pretty woman is going to give you heartache. It says, according to Jimmy Soul. Stick to but anyway, I don't think that's what uh, Jesus is talking about, that kind of happiness. Uh, eight conditions in order to be blessed or happy. And as I said, I'm not going to look at all eight. I'm only going to look at the first one. And the first six words on this Sermon on the Mount is this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Six words. Six words. But boy, are they loaded with meaning. If you want to be happy or blessed, you must become, I must become poor in spirit. That's what the verse says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now Jesus was not talking, as you can, as you obviously have discovered already, just by those words. He wasn't talking about physical poverty. He wasn't talking about economic poverty or material poverty. He's speaking about spiritual poverty. That's why he's saying, in spirit. So it's something inside. It's something inside of us. It's an attitude. But you know, attitudes always have a way of showing themselves on the outside. So we've got to develop this inwardly. Now, different translations of the Bible help to bring out the meaning a little more fully. The NIV says, blessed are the poor in spirit, as we've read. The New Living Testament says, God blesses those who realize their need of Him. The Good News Version says God blesses those who recognize that they are spiritually poor. The Contemporary English Version says God blesses those who depend only on Him. God blesses those who depend only on Him. The New Century Version says God blesses those who know they have great spiritual need. You see that pattern developing there. I must become aware of the fact that I am hopelessly inadequate of living my life without God. I must become aware of it. And then I must internalize this. And I must think about this. And I must try to develop this way of living. Psalm 146, verse 5 says, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Another translation says, Blessed is everyone who trusts in him and depends upon him. So in those two words, trust and dependence. Those who trust in the Lord and those who depend upon the Lord. Now, you know, that sounds wonderful, but how do I do this? How do I really do this? How do I cultivate or develop a spirit that demonstrates that I humbly depend upon God instead of myself? How do I do this so that it becomes a part of my daily living? Now, I don't know whether I'll get through all of this, but. There, there, are, 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 there could be many more uh, suggestions, but there are five practical ways which, if I practice, will help me become someone who is poor in spirit. I may not get through this. But number one is that I depend on God's wisdom and not my own. I depend on God's wisdom and not my own. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end 
for in the end it leads to death. Have you ever felt, and I can see as, as is often mentioned from the front over here, that we are all people who've done a fair bit of living already. Have you ever felt that you were to do something that seemed so right, and in the end, it turned out to be the wrong thing? Have you ever heard somebody say, just go with, go with your gut feeling? Or, as one of these popularly uh, uh, spouted these days, just follow your heart. And in both these cases, it's referring to follow your feelings. Now, I personally can let you know that my feelings in any one day, you know, go from a high to a low and maybe back in and left and right and all over the place. There's a song, there's a popular song also, there was one that was very old, but there's one that's often uh, uh, played these days also that says, How can something be so wrong when it feels so right? How can something be so wrong when it feels right? And so sometimes to, the, to our peril we follow our right feeling even if we know it is wrong, just because it feels right. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is the most, uh, is the most wonderful word. Uh, uh, this has become, um, not by choice, I'll tell you why, but this has become a very, very important verse in my life that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Amen. I've got a, a, a sister who just turned 75, Ursula is her name. I, I love having a sister like Ursula, because she has been, she's carried me in her heart uh, from the days of my youth. She's always cared for me, spiritually, spiritually. She was always concerned about me spiritually. And Ursula made it a habit to pray for me, and still prays for me, on a daily basis. And Ursula sends me this verse. Every year on the 21st of December, which happens to be my birthday, every birthday card Ursula sends me, or these days, you know, they come electronically, you know, on the WhatsApp message. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is there. Now, Ursula must have seen something in me that I was too blind to see. Why she felt that she should give me the same verse. The same verse. I said, gosh, surely Ursula can find, you know, another verse. But she felt that this was the verse that I needed to hear. Sadly, I never always ever followed the advice of this verse. That's why she does it. So she must have known that Noel has a way of doing his own thing. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct you. The New Living Testament says it like this, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, respect the Lord Amen. and turn your back on evil. Yeah, I, I, I've got to confess before all of you, and I do this regularly in, in, in uh, groups that I'm with, uh, and acknowledge that I didn't always follow this advice. And in many cases, I, I did my own thing. I didn't maybe say it in so many words, but my actions, as I look back now, shows that in many cases, I leaned on my own understanding. Sometimes it was 
under the, uh, the words experience. You know? I was the most um, well versed with that particular, so people were sent to me for it. I, you know, I had the, the wonderful privilege of being a, a strategic coordinator uh, for um, 25 to 30 international and interdenominational missionaries. And whenever a new missionary arrived on the field, they were sent to me. And one of my friends uh, jokingly used to say, you know, you know, no, he's the godfather. Everybody has to go to hell. And you know, that went to my head. That went to my head. And I, 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 I really did believe that, you know, everybody needs to come by me. You know, I would, I would get, show them the ropes of what it's like to live in the tropics in the Philippines. I would give them advice on where to buy the best motorcycle for the kind of terrain that we were going to be traveling in. And I gave them advice. I would take them into the marketplace and show them this is where you get this and this is. And soon I became the popular guy. Go to know. He'll help you. And so I really started trusting in my own wisdom and understanding. And it all seemed to be alright for many years. And then later on, it wasn't. So how do I get God's wisdom? You know, it sounds simple. <laughs> in fact, it's probably easier. But I didn't do it. If you want to get God's wisdom, James 1 verse 5 says it very clearly and plainly. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should pray and ask God, who gives it generously and graciously, listen to this, to all, to all, not just to certain people, not just to those who preach from the top here or behind here. God gives it to all who asks. So all I have to do is ask. Pray and ask. So if you ask me, how can I know if I'm depending and trusting on God? Number one, I would be talking to him on a daily basis. In fact, I would probably be talking to him throughout the day, as I go along. And number two, I would be reading his word. If you want to have God's wisdom, go directly to him. That's the wonderful privilege we all have. All of us can approach the throne of God. All of us have access to him and then read God's words and as I says if you are doing these two simple actions daily then you know you are trusting in and depending on God if you're talking to God every day all day I don't mean you've got to come to church I mean as you go talk to God ask for wisdom ask for direction and then take time to read God's word then you know that you are trusting in and depending upon God. But if I am not praying daily, if I just rush out of the house every morning, you know, before I know it, I'm already meeting with this person, meeting with this person, and, 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 and then the day is long spent. If I don't take time to read God's word daily, then I am depending on my own wisdom, leaning on my own understanding, and not God's. Listen to this. This is not mine. It was from Rick Warren. Rick says, God's wisdom and God's will are both found in God's word. God's wisdom and God's will are both found in God's word. So if I don't take time to read God's word daily, 
then I will not be trusting in the Lord with all my heart, but instead I would be leaning on my own understanding. So I told you there were five, but I'm only going to do two, because the second one I believe is very important. Also, the second way that I can develop this, this uh, culture or this attitude of being poor in spirit or humbly depending upon God is if I depend on God's strength and not my own. I depend on God's strength and not my own. I am beginning to realize now that um, I can sometimes do with a power nap. A power nap. I, couldn't, I never needed it before. But nowadays I find that, you know, just a 15 minute to 20 minute uh, nap in the afternoon refreshes me. It works for me now. Never did before. But, you know, we're not just referring to physical brute strength here, but spiritual stamina, mental and emotional spiritual stamina. Psalm 84 verse 5 says, in the contemporary English version, you bless all who depend on you for their strength. Isaiah 40 verse 31 is a well-loved one by most people. It says, in the King James and in the NIV, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. In the international uh, everyday version it says those who trust in the Lord will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary, they will walk and not grow weak. Now I tend to be doing a lot of listening to Rick Warren lately and part of it is because he plays such a huge role in championing the, the cause of the ministry Celebrate Recovery and has done so for 33 years. And uh, I was listening to Rick one day talk about this particular verse and then he, I don't know how many of you know, but Rick had a son who struggled with depression. And they had a habit that this son would, they would always spend family times together and the son was living on his own and then he would drive from them, their home, say goodbye. And then when he gets to his residence, he would call and say, I am home safely. Or send a message, I've arrived safely. And they would all, you know, rest in peace for the rest of that night. But then there was this one night when he never sent a message and he never contacted him and the next morning they found that he had committed suicide and many people were shocked Here Rick is the, the pastor of this mega Saddleback church who has like 10 or more other campuses and, and a worldwide ministry had a son who struggled with depression and eventually committed suicide. And Rick and Kay have, uh, have, have, have developed a, a ministry, or Kay particularly, his wife, has developed a ministry along the lines of, of mental health and helping people who struggle with mental health issues. But Rick said this as he, I was listening to him in one of his messengers. He says, I would not be able to do what I am doing if I did not depend upon God's strength to carry me. I would get stuck, he said, just thinking about this precious son of ours who took his life the way he did. And so Rick says, if I did not depend on God's strength on a daily basis, I wouldn't make it. I wouldn't make it. Psalm 71 verse 16 in the Living Bible says, I walk in the strength of the Lord. Psalm 73 verse 6 says, My health may fail me, 
my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Some of you may have heard of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was the founder of the China Inland Mission, the mission that Jean and I joined that became the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And in joining that mission, it was an assignment that we had to read the life, the biographies of James Hudson Taylor. He was known as the father of the faith missions. The man of great faith brought the gospel to China. The most, uh, he was known mostly because of the fact that he dressed like a Chinese and spoke like one of them too. And uh, in one of his biographies, one of the writers uh, who wrote a biography of his, one of the many, says that, that, that on his last, these were words that he uttered. He said, you know what? I can't, I can't speak anymore. I can't write. I can't sit up. There is very little that I can do. I am so old and frail. I can only trust. I can only trust. Even the great apostle Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. He says, after receiving wonderful revelations and insight into who God is and how God works, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. And I asked many times that this be taken away from me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will gladly boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I close with this now. Many of you may know that I have great weakness and I have had a great struggle in my life for a very long time. And I will let you know that I am not ashamed to sit in an AA meeting and say these words, my name is Noel and I am an alcoholic. For the sake of being salt and light to those with whom I enjoy uh, 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 joining in with in the group. It reminds me that I am powerless over my addiction, but that God has all power. It reminds me that God is God and I am not. I realize that I am not God and that without him in my life, my life is unmanageable. And when I acknowledge my weakness, I rest and depend on Christ's strength. And I find that God uses me most when I say what I am weak with. When I am weak, I demonstrate that I cannot live life without God.